Hey, what's up, Liron here. I want to share with you two insights that will help you to continuously, infinitely grow in watercolor painting. This is quite important. Um, so I'm going to start with this uh, rainy scene in Florence. This is a picture I took a long time ago. I'm showing you snippets of the process, but when it comes to the most important part, we're going to focus in. The drawing here is large to small, as you can probably tell by now, that's how I work. I establish the overall proportions and relations between different large structures, and then I hone in on the details within them. But here are the two insights. So it's one insight that divided to two. So the basic idea is for every painting you create, you will probably expose some of your strengths and weaknesses. And the way I look at strengths and weaknesses is strengths are the th things that you were able to do just like you visualized. They work really well. They look correct to you. To you, there is no objective right or wrong here. And the weaknesses are those that you missed. Now, to me, a huge insight here was the thing I did get right, which is the sky, and you're going to see in a second. That kind of a control really well with the timing of the gentle wet and wet to put in the clouds is something I wasn't able to do just a couple of months ago this consistently. And it's a couple of insights that really clicked. So first off, I covered the, the sky with some kind of a gray wash. As I move into the buildings, I'm starting to yellow it up. Okay, the, building, the buildings are warm. I'm not going to lie. I did not get the colors right as I wanted, but that's a topic for another time. That's something I'm pretty okay with in this example. But wait till we get to the insight of the, the weakness. You're going to like it, I think. Um, now, you see me starting to mix a bit of a thick paint, and the timing is perfect for that. So you'll notice that these clouds stay in their place, but still get loose edges. That was the thing I was going for. And this is something I had a lot of trouble achieving in the past. What I would do is go in too early. And so everything would spread out and I wouldn't get these very distinct shapes. This was something that finally, finally clicked for me in the last couple of weeks of exactly how to do this. It was a lack in my understanding of the timing of when I put the paint in. Now, here I'm putting a bit of warmth. So far, it was a bit of a neutral. Here's where it gets interesting. If you're able only to do what I'm doing here, which is figure out the, the things that worked and the things that didn't work from the standpoint of <clears throat> did I achieve what I set out to achieve? If you can always do that, you will continuously grow. You will get to where you want to get in watercolor. I know it sounds super basic, but the nuance is usually there's a gap in understanding of how things work. And to me, there was a gap in the timing. I thought I need to come back with slightly darker washes fast, soon after I lay down the wash. But there was actually a period where I should have waited probably at least 60 seconds more. That was the gap in my understanding. As soon as that gap closed, I can achieve these wet and wet effects very consistently now. <clears throat> but on we go with this wash where we're establishing the buildings. Um, it's, it's, everything is gray. It's a, a rainy day. Look at how beautifully this uh, spraying the water helps the paint move down. I love that kind of a thing. But everything was quite muted, quite uh, gray. We're playing on the gentle kind of transitions from this kind of a gray to that kind of a gray, where for the most part we have just a, a yellow gray and a red gray for that roof there okay now one thing to remember in these kinds of scenes is again if you're trying to paint it as you see it i'm going to do some wet and weather same gentle technique i did but only to shift the color this time not to change the value like we did with the clouds um the thing to understand about these scenes is usually the sky is the lightest bit and everything else is darker just because of how the the light and shadow work because it's overcast. Um, so we don't get any sharp highlights within the, the city part of things, right? Um, so what this means is everything below the skyline, the, the sky itself should be darker. And that's exactly where I'm gonna take it. Now I'm tilting this to help all the paint move down. I'm gonna put just a bit more yellow paint here and there. Now, just to, to talk a bit about what I messed up when it comes to the colors, um, I went a little too red on the yellows. They should have been more of a clean yellow. And yeah, that's something, it's a recurring mistake I kind of did here. I used a bit too much red for all my mixing here. Don't know why it happened, 
but it happens to me sometimes where I go to red and not enough yellow. So I end up with a purple instead of an orange. That is something now that I think about I need to pay attention to. Too much purple, not enough orange sometimes. I'll have that in mind. But in any case, now I'm starting to establish that the fact that everything below the sky is darker. So always, 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 if you start with more water, you'll have more time. It doesn't mean you have to start necessarily with a very wet wash, but just know that if you want to give yourself more time, it's usually beneficial to start with a wet wash, lighter wash, and darken it as you go along. Now, sometimes you won't, you don't want to make that trade-off, you just want to get the value in there, which, which can happen. Uh, to me, I'm almost in the middle there. I'm using a wash that allows me to get flow, but it's still not as light as I would typically go for these types of scenes. Okay. Now, my, my main mistake here was in the values, but that led to exposing one of my current big weaknesses, surprisingly enough, has to do with lightening things up. Okay, so I'm actually quite okay with the values and where they turned out, but you'll see soon. These are the types of washes that are a little trickier because you almost need to constantly be aware of the overall picture and the th small detail you're looking working on so that you still maintain the flow in the overall picture and you still get the details to look the way you want them to look. Um, it's a bit of a mind stretch. Uh, which is not a bad thing. It's it's one of those things, again, the more you do, the more you understand, the more you, you gain awareness of what's going on on paper. A lot of watercolor painting is dancing with the paint, seeing what it gives you and reacting accordingly. Um, the most common thing I see with beginners is just lack of awareness of what's going on on paper. They don't know when an edge is starting to dry and is no longer workable, when an edge is calling for them to blend it, to change it, to even a color, that's one more thing you'll notice a lot. But yeah, so as I mentioned, everything is in the nuances, everything is gray, this is a gray red, it's not really a red, it's a reddish gray, even a bit on the verge of purple. Uh, and I'm going wet and wet here to add these shadows underneath, and I know once I get to the actual building, I'm gonna continue that wash with a bit of yellow. Now here is where I made the very minor mistake that later, and I'm happy I made it, because it shed a lot of light on where I'm at with opaque paint. I went just a touch too dark, just a touch. And then when I compared it to the reference photo, I saw that this building in the front, you see this, this is too dark. This building in the front, <coughs> I realized was way too dark, not way too dark, it touched uh, too dark. And I wanted to really bring it out by lightening it. The only way to do that was, was with opaque paint and you will see. Uh, now I'm doing the same process, started a little wetter continuing with a bit of darker within those wets. There are some interesting shapes there. You see the the building on the rightmost goes a little diagonally. It's the kind of things that I really like to observe and include in a painting. Um, now I spray, I constantly spray just to keep things wetter. But right now we have a good distinction, I think, generally speaking, between the sky and the buildings. So at least that's something that is working. And I am using this opportunity to put in some of the windows there. The timing is pretty good so that they, they will stay in place. And because there's so much to the edge of the painting, I don't mind if they have smooth edges, actually. I prefer that even, because um, that will help me later on to keep this area kind of blurry, okay? Uh, a couple of small details there for the, uh, mostly it's um, little chimneys, little, I don't know, pipes that lead whatever out. Um, and while it is still wet, I can still go and add more darkness, but I'm gonna tilt it a bit uh, so that the dark paint moves away from the building. You're going to see this in a couple of seconds. <coughs> I can still work this. This is still workable. And some of my darks have melted away. So I'm putting them back in, including these windows. But this is pretty much final. I'm not going to need to put them in again. But where we do end up is with that front building being just a touch too dark. Um, now I could let that go, just darken a bit around it and finish it up. But I was determined to lighten it. You'll see in a second. I'm um, adding a few of these, you know, small touches of dark paint to establish the shapes of the shingles. Um, these are the types of things you get to decide. Do you want to paint a shingle by shingle? Do you want to paint the pattern? Both of these are very um, different results, very different skills, very different levels of understanding of detail. And it's something you may want to explore. Uh, I definitely like sometimes to paint more macro, showing the large details. Sometimes I do like to paint a little um, 
macro, just getting the overall feel of it. Uh, which can be complex sometimes because you have a lot, the shingles have a lot of highlights, shadows, highlights, shadows. And you've seen with my painting shingles, uh, how it works when you actually paint all of these details individually. And here you can see how I simplify them. Uh, this was, uh, the other pictures were also from Florence, the one that shingles is based on. Uh, just a different day, a bit more sunny. This is a bit more of a rainier day. The first couple of days we were there, first day or two were rainy. Um, now I'm just putting in a bit more oranges. That's where I kind of realized, oh, I'm missing oranges. Still not enough to shift the tone of the entire painting, of course. Uh, but that's okay. You know, mild inaccuracies in color aren't really a deal breaker unless that is your standard. That is something you dislike. I don't mind it as much as long as the overall impression is there. What I care more about is the subtleties of value being preserved. Um, it has nothing to do really with realism. I just, I don't know why I always appreciated values. Um, I, you know, because a lot of people say the only the values are needed for realism. It is true to some extent, but that's not even the reason. I just love something about the basicness of values. Uh, that I try to preserve. I'm gonna put in a few of these dark details on the antennas, uh, the antennas, the uh, chimneys. It really will bring them out a lot and will will make them look good. Uh, I didn't realize um, just how much those little bits were important over them. Um, now here we're starting with the saga of making that building in the front lighter. So first I am thinking, okay, let's darken the thing around it and let it go. Um, now, the way I do this is a lot of people are scared of that glaze, that next glaze after you already have something on paper, and I get it. Sometimes it can be a little tricky. You'll have to experiment. Honestly, it depends on the type of paper you use, the type of um, paints you use, uh, the, the texture of the paper, the brushes. You'll get different levels of ability to mess with it, depending on whatever tools you're using. Uh, and sometimes the same paper may allow more and less. It's so weird how that works sometimes. Uh, sometimes if the paper is a little old, it won't allow you to manipulate it as much. Uh, it really can change. So experimentation is the best route there. And I don't really have a clear cut answer myself. It's I go by instinct and usually it end up, ends up working. Uh, so we see I'm making some darker areas around that building, make a distinction out of it. Um, starting to darken here but you'll see by the end of this wash there is this small small gap where the building in the center should be yellower and lighter and that that color also eluded me a bit that that's not as annoying to me as the value but it also was kind of like what is that color <laughs> yeah but i'm using this opportunity bringing in some details bringing in some um <clears throat> darkening some of the uh, details behind which by the way this area i shouldn't have darkened at all it was kind of the right value i went back and checked uh it was pretty pretty accurate but that's fine um still maintaining an overall shapes overall impression by connecting the, this large shadow defining the edge of the rooftop by that and you have to understand again if you're used to high contrast scenes painting something like this that is very overcast will be a bit of a challenge these are the types of paintings I would mess up the most when I got started. Um, and I still do to this day mess up the most usually. Um, sometimes it's a matter of it's just not inspiring me and then I have to kind of um, acknowledge that and just move on. Sometimes it's a gap in skill and then I, a couple of attempts and I get it right. Because uh, I can still get overcast right. I usually just need something to grab me in terms of contrasts. Uh, but yeah. Now I'm yellowing this side of the building. Felt like... It, under that diagonal shift, it should be a little warmer. You can see this in the reference photo, probably. Um, and very carefully just thinking, okay, what's missing here? What's missing there? Now, here is where I still feel like that building in the middle um, could be a little better if I go lighter. So what I'm doing here is I'm mixing John Brilliant by Shinhan PWC, and you can find the exact colors I use in the description box. Uh, I'm, I'm going wet and wet almost. Um, to try and bring it up a notch. Now, the, the thing I should have done is just let it go at this point and call it done, just add a few details to the background, but that's okay. Now, this is the second insight, came a little later in the video, I know, but I mentioned, I alluded to, to it. It has to do with using opaque paint, wet and wet, not when it's very clear, okay, I'm using it for a highlight, because I believe there's huge potential here to manipulate the paint much easier. I know some people would just say it's like gouache. Yes, but it's still a bit different with watercolor. 
I see some potential here and I don't know if it has to do with the color choices, but I definitely know that it has to do with my understanding of how to use a, an opaque paint wet and wet because it works a little differently in that it actually works the same. Uh, when you use more water, it's less of the paint you see, so it becomes less opaque. It becomes more transparent. It becomes darker. So that's one of the only instances where using more water makes it darker. Because usually when you mix, and you, you can and you can listen back to what I just said if it doesn't make full sense yet. If you add water to a normal watercolor, it makes it lighter. But because an opaque paint is meant to cover something and it's light, when you add water, you actually make it darker because um, you see less of the, the opaque paint, if that makes sense. So now I'm going to kick it into time-lapse because I want to show you all of these failed experiments where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to cover it with a thick layer of opaque paint. And what I notice is even if the layer feels thick, once it starts to dry, it still looks too light. So my understanding of how much water to paint ratio I need to use here was lacking. And it's something I'll work on and I'm really considering how to work on it to devote a painting fully to mixing it up with um, opaque and, and non-opaque. And I don't mean something like Chen Chung Wei would do, which is um, he would freely mix his transparent with opaque to create interesting colors. That's something I also do, especially with my um, this um, cobalt uh, blue variation I'm using there in the palette too, uh, where it's kind of opaque, so I'm adding it with transparent paints to make it look better. Or I would use French ultramarine with a bit of uh, designer's gouache. That's a bit of a different case. Uh, I'm talking just purely using it to bring back uh, lighter areas. Uh, but yeah, I'm using this opportunity while I have this opaque paint to add some details all around the painting. I think the painting looks relatively good now, but the thing is all of the this building in the front it's still wet, which is why it still looks opaque. Once it dries, you'll see it looks much more faded. And it could be that now with fresh eyes, I see it and think to myself, oh, it's perfect. I shouldn't have changed it at all. This can also happen. Maybe a matter of patience and kind of allowing the painting to paint itself even after you've finished painting it. Uh, but yeah, adding a few of these details here and there. Some oranges, there are some terracotta kind of... Um, um, you know, uh, what do you call these? Not vases, you know, the the bases where you put the plants in and the balconies which is lovely it's a lovely lovely view it was really we got lucky with the apartment too it was an airbnb and it was just perfect uh, like really long windows tall ceilings um, one of our best you know apartments uh, now to add some interest because this is very yellow and red mostly or uh, mostly red not enough orange i am adding a bit of blue here and there that same blue i was talking about cobalt variation just here and there to make the windows sing a bit and be in contrast i find it giving the viewer some kind of point of color contrast um makes it look good i really like it the way it looks and and i think people appreciate that um and I also added a bit of that blue to the window in the building up front, but I lost it after I added more opaque paint. Uh, so that was another place where I didn't really fully understand what I'm doing, I think. Um, here I go, adding that in. Uh, and you will see, if you remember, I did something similar with the desert scene that I painted. Uh, was it? I forgot its name. <clears throat> I forgot the title. But I did a very similar thing. So now I'm going to sign this, but I'm not done yet because I'm here to, to ruin what is working. Because notice how much lighter it dried, how much darker it dried, sorry. So I'm doing another layer. I'm like, okay, worst case, I'm going to burn this painting, burn it, meaning it's not no longer, you know, uh, what it was. That's okay. I, I added a lot more of that yellow-orange I have, and you can see all of the colors in my palette in the description box. Um, but I thought, now oh, what the heck, just go for it, see what happens. <clears throat> spray on it, tilt it, and I actually really like the way it looks right now. I'm kind of manipulating some of the edges there. I really, really like the way it looks now. It's just a shame that once it dries, it no longer looks like this, which is exactly what I need to work on. And I'm using a tissue just to lift back the, sharpen these edges that spread out due to the tissue. Once again, I dry to light. Once again, I'm going with another wash. I, again, I was like, okay, I'm just going to try and experiment. It was for washes i was a little frustrated when i was done because i just felt like there's something i'm missing because i keep covering it with opaque paint and it's never enough um i'll have to figure it out maybe it is enough and again my perception of the painting was skewed um but all i was looking for is just to lighten that building 
a touch and I barely was able to do that but I think this is where I'm kind of letting it go and um, ending up with this as the end result now if you look um, in a couple of seconds, I'll show you the final scan, spray with the water. Uh, it was the final result, still dried a little too light to my taste. So I'm missing something there. I'm not sure what it is. It could be the fact that once this paint dries, even after it dries, once you spray on it, it still lightens up. I'm not sure. Um, but it's something for me to continue exploring. The bottom line is this. If you're able to consistently with every painting, not in an analytical, critical, boring way, but in the way of understanding what you're missing, <clears throat> you'll be able to con continuously solve it for the next time. And sometimes it takes a while for these understandings to mature. So it's not going to be, okay, the next painting is better. When I first got started with watercolor, every painting did feel like it's a, a huge improvement uh, over the next painting. Every painting would feel that. But the more I kind of settled in somewhere and <clears throat> attained, a, sorry, my voice, uh, attained a bit of a higher uh, level, that's when it became a little trickier to catch these. And it's uh, like you actually have to catch them. But once you are aware of them, they will never escape you. Once you notice something, that alone, the, the act of noticing it will start the process of solving the issue so that you never run into it in the first place um, and that is what i wanted to share with you today i hope it makes sense be sure to check out my frustration free watercolor course if you want to learn how to let go enjoy the watercolor process let the paint do its thing as much as possible i think you'll really appreciate that one the the feedback has been wonderful ever since i published it people have been mentioning to me all the time with emails, messages that it allows them to finally let go. Um, so I urge you to check that out if you want to take care of, of this thing finally and solve this problem because I think that's the biggest roadblock to almost anyone. That freedom, once you attain that freedom, you're good to go. I freely explore, fully freely explore. I wish I could somehow communicate to you how, how much... I, I like that, be like water. I really just let the paint guide me and I may start a process one way and the next day I'll start a different process completely differently, completely agnostic to the process because I know that the process doesn't really matter. It's just a byproduct of the freedom of creation. I hope that makes sense. I hope you'll give it a go. I will take this opportunity also to send huge, huge thanks to everyone who supports me over on Patreon. You allow me to publish tons of content out there for free uh, so huge thanks to you and if you do want to uh, get credited at the end of the videos check that out there are a few exclusive processes there thank you so so much have a wonderful 2024 and i will see you in the next video